All right, great. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you for having this paper in the program. It's great to be here. So I'll be talking about um, the phenomenon of uh, slowing uh, labor force participation of married women in the US. And in this paper, we explore the role of rising inequality between the genders as a potential you know, factor behind this, this phenomenon. So this is the fact that I'm looking at. Um, here in this graph, we have the orange line is labor force participation of married women over time, so we start in 1976 and we go to 2009 before the crisis, uh, well 2008 I think is the last year before the crisis. And uh, on the, the other line, the green line, shows the evolution of the gender wage gap. So we see that we have this you know, well-known increase in female participation and then there's the plateau phenomenon but we also observe a similar phenomenon for the gender wage gap. So it's improving over time and then it stops improving. So in this paper we look at what goes behind this, like who are the women who are behind this, um, this changing trend. And additionally to this fact, we look at the evolution of the skill premium in the US by genders. And so what we see is that the skill premium has you know, accelerated over time for men, which is the line on top, at a faster pace than for women, which is the line at the bottom of the graph. Can you see this okay? Okay. So um, what we see is that the trends used to be more or less parallel up until the mid-1990s. And then there's a larger jump for the skill premium evolution for men than that for women. <coughs> so here I'm just showing um, the skill premium as the ratio between the wage for full-time skilled workers defined as workers with college or more to the wage of full-time unskilled workers defined as those with less than college degree. <coughs> So what we do in this paper is we study, you know, the fact that this change happened around the same time as the plateauing in the labor for participation <coughs> of married women. So our hypothesis is that this rise in the skilled premium can help explain this lack of convergence that we observe in participation of married women since the early 1990s. So the mechanism for this would have to do with a cross-income effect within the household. So the rise in male earnings or the differential rise with respect to the potential earnings for women would generate a negative wealth effect on the labor supply uh, of the wife. So <clears throat> this plus an effect on the accumulation of human capital when women stop participating participating in the labor force, their human capital depreciates, and in turn this helps determine the evolution of wages, and so that evolution also slows down. So this, this phenomenon also helps account for the slowing down in the improvement in the gender wage gap. So, I'm sorry? This is the mince of our human. What's the <laughs> what's the question Jacob like? Mentor, Jacob <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't I don't get your question. Sorry. No, just oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. Um. <laughs> well, I mention him when I run regressions usually. <laughs> <laughs> So um, our obje objectives for this paper is to document uh, the empirical evidence behind this, looking at you know, who are these women who they are married uh, to, and exploring this potential income mechanism with a quantitative model that I'll be calibrating. So we, we will see using this model how much of this behavior we can explain with only this very simple mechanism. So just to preview the findings before I go into the evidence, um, so you don't forget what I'm trying to explain, uh, the mechanism that we propose, this cross-income effect, can account for a large fraction of the lack of convergence um, between participation of women to that of men. And in particular, um, it can also reproduce the lack of convergence in wages. 
So there's, well, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about the literature that covers the behavior of female labor supply. Uh, there's not a lot of attention that has been paid to this uh, plateauing or particular explanations behind this behavior. So I'll, I'll skip that. And um, I'll be talking about the evidence um, for a while. And after I've convinced you that it's an interesting fact that's worth looking into, I'll describe the model that we use. It's very simple. And then we calibrate it and have some quantitative uh, results to back up this mechanism. So for the evidence, we use data from the CPS and the PSID. We look at adults ages 25 to 64 because mainly we are interested in the you know, behavior during those working years and we don't want to look too much into retirement behaviors. We are focusing on married and uh, the way I define labor force participation uh, for the purpose of this paper um, requires that the person is either working or looking for work during at least 40 weeks in a year. So that I don't get, you know, with spurious participation, I want to get a sense of a person that's attached to the labor force for more or less a permanent, um, kind of a more stable attachment. Oops. So um, again, the measure of the um, skill premium that we that I showed before, but here I just want to point out a way of kind of measuring how this phenomenon, of how big this phenomenon is, of this divergent be divergence between the genders in terms of the skill premium. This is the same graph, but then now I plotted a linear trend that fits more or less nicely, you know, during the first years. But then you can see how the deviation from that linear trend is much larger for men than for women. So uh, with this in mind, we just we quantify this deviation from the trend as the measure of how much this inequality has affected, um, you know, the wage difference between the genders. And we see that when we look at the evolution of the gender wage gap for college graduates, the difference between um, the actual gender wage gap and that that would be if we project the same behavior forward is, uh, is larger for the college workers than for the um, high school workers. And now going to the labor supply of women, um, I just wanted to compare it to men because um, I often get this question of what's going on with the men. Uh, so we see here, looking at the PSID, that the evolution of married women is very similar to what I showed you before, but then men, there's not a lot going on in this, in this series. So uh, and we want to understand why this, these women are, you know, plateauing at this level. For some groups, right? For for the but some of those uh, individuals whose employment has gone down are single, because remember the single men are those who are most likely to be unemployed, and and you know so I think it's that group the one that's behind that statistics. And here, there's like a you know one or two percent decline, but it's uh, it's not a lot. So these are married men. Yeah, well, not the same graph, but it's still, you still get the difference. Um, the difference is larger for men than for women. Yes, but even at the top, you still have diff gender differences. Like even at the executive level, which are the ones at, the, you know, at that extreme of the distribution, you still have level differences in the compensation between the, for the two genders. <clears throat> so about this phenomenon, the, um, the slowing of, of participation is mainly a phenomenon for married women. Uh, the participation of single women has remained stable over this period. Uh, the participation of divorced and separated women has also remained mostly stable. So this is, uh, married women are the only ones who slow down. Yes.
later in your period, they basically left. So they yeah, but no, this is. There, there are, but this is a phenomenon that goes on uh, for, for primate women mainly. So here, let me show you. Here we have the participation of different groups of uh, different age groups. Yes. So the green line that you can't really see is this one. <coughs> this is the youngest group. This is 21 to 31. Okay. So you see this group is the one that has this behavior and then this is the next group, which is the 32 to 42, and they also have that behavior, whereas the older women are this. So, yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenon that's there for, and this was one of the surprising things, like, oh, so this is, you know, these are young women who are stopping their participation. <clears throat> and then, well, so I already mentioned that labor force participation of these women, it kind of falls short of that of the other groups. Um, it's important for the young women, and these are all the other groups. So these are men, uh, single women, divorced or separated women, and these are married women. So you see they're not um, getting to the same level as the other groups. So uh, to measure by how much, because we're trying to measure a change in trends, um, what we are doing, what we're going to do is estimate a profit model before the change to kind of predict what's the expected rate of participation of married women given their characteristics and take into account composition effects, etc. And then we let that estimation predict what the you know, expected participation would have been after 1995 um, if, you know, everything else had remained the same, but only the composition of the potential workforce changes. So we do this, uh, I show you here for different household types uh, defined by the combination of educations of the husbands and wives. So here on the left we have the high school husbands and the orange line is the participation of college educated women who are married to high school husbands the green line is the participation of high school educated women who are married to high school husbands. So if we use the model, we see that there is still something unexplained there by this you know, projection. Like we would expect that these women by the year 2005, 2008 would be participating a bit more. But if you go on and look at college husbands, and then again the orange line are college women and the, and the green line are high school women, you see that this phenomenon is much larger for this group. So the unexplained you know, component or the difference between the actual level of participation and that <coughs> that we projected is much larger for this group. And that it's also present for both levels of education of the wife. And this was also surprising because if you see college educated women are basically suffering like a sudden stop at that level. Like, it's not only you know, the less educated women. <clears throat> so, um, well, I already mentioned this slowdown in participation has been greatest for um, women with college husbands and we measure it by taking the average difference between the level of the projected participation and the actual participation and that's like 17% for college women with college husbands and 17% for college women with, um, for um, high school women with college husbands. And we see that this difference between the actual participation and the projected participation is strongly correlated with the earnings of the husband. Here I plot the difference by quintiles of the husband's earnings. And uh, even though we see that the difference is always positive, as I showed you before, this, this prediction is not perfect in capturing the change in behavior. But we see that this difference grows a, a lot larger when the husband has um, higher earnings. <clears throat> uh, so here we show the, the bottom um, 10 percentile for the husband's earnings. Um, when the husband's earnings is at the bottom 10 percentile, we still see 
you know, 6% difference. But then when the husband is in the top 10th uh, percentile of the earnings distribution, the difference goes up to 25. So this is an indicative of this negative, of the potential of this negative income effect going on in the household. So um, one more um, factor that kind of helps us figure, um, you know, put some evidence towards the fact that the, there's the strong um, negative income effects is that average labor earnings of house husbands who are in one earner households are systematically higher than the average earnings of husbands who are in two earner households. And the ratio between um, the wage of husbands in one earner households to that of two earner households has gone up during this second period. If you compare it to the pre-1995, post-1995, the ratio between these two types of husbands has gone up. Additionally, we look at the assets, even though we won't be trying to explain savings behavior in the model, we look at the evolution of net worth by household types. And here I show it over time, and the orange line at the bottom is the lower educated households. And we see that there's a lot of asset accumulation for the higher educated households. Um, and one more thing, we look at the labor flows, uh, and this is much more of a macro perspective. So we look at the flows from employment to non-employment and from non-employment to employment. And we see that um, the difference between the previous 1994 period and post-1995 period is, um, you know, goes up a lot in the, the exit flows, the employment to non-employment goes up a lot for college, college households. And the non-employment to employment flows, which are the entry to the workforce, go down um, also for those households. So let me jump to the quantitative analysis. Uh, the model that we use is as simple as we can get in order to capture this effect. So we're going to be looking at households that are composed by two married partners, a man and a woman, and they have independent utility functions. And we assume that all the marital decisions and the education decisions have been made before. So they're, they're exogenous groups of households that um, are defined by their educational attainment, and we assume there's no divorce. So we focus our attention on married couples that stay married, so we want to understand how big these income effects can be in those households. So we assume heterogeneity in individual productivity, and this individual productivity is going to have a distribution that depends on the education level of each partner. And the only degree of assortative matching, let's say, that we allow is to take into account the composition of households by education in the, you know, in the economy. So we don't go into trying to match unobserved high types with other unobserved high types. We assume there's an intensive and extensive uh, margin for labor supply decisions. And uh, market and home hours are going to be efficiently allocated. And because we assume there's on the job acquisition of human capital, the evolution of wages is going to be endogenous. So when an individual stops participating in the labor force, their human capital suffers a depreciation. And that in turn is reflected then in, in potential wages that they can make when they go back. So the problem that the household solves is the maximization of the uh, present value of the weighted average of the utility functions of the two members. So there's a lambda that we assume fixed, and the utility depends on consumption, market hours, and home hours. The household decides how much to consume, how many home hours each of the partners produces, how many market hours, if any, so there's a possibility of not participating, savings, and how much human capital for the next period. So human capital is a function of the current level of human capital, but also current level of market hours. So if an individual has you know, a high productivity and a high, a high level of human capital, there's more incentives to work longer hours to accumulate further human capital later. Um, there's a home production function that depends on hours for the husband and the wife, and there's the budget constraint. 
And I think that's, that's it. Oh, and we also have an age profile for the home hours to reflect the variation over the life cycle. In, in we have an age profile for the home production requirement that reflects the variation over the life cycle in home hours. Right. It's a fixed cost. It's a fixed cost. Yes, and so it's it gives an you know a usage for the wife's um, <coughs> time basically. So I, I here is time. So I here is yes. So this would be like we should think of the education category. Yes, uh, S is gender, and I is the type that depends on the education. But also uh, within education categories, there's also individual types because there's a distribution of productivity. Okay. So, well, we'll see in the next slide. So we assume that labor can be either zero or larger than the lower bound. If participation is one, then there's a minimum amount of hours that um, the individual has to work. Um, and I already covered this. So here wages, um, which is the most uh, interesting. This is where most of the action comes in. So we try to be as symmetric in the setup of the model as possible, but then we're going to have some gender differences for wages. So the, the wage of an individual of type I, H, J, and gender S is determined by their individual productivity. There's an I missing here, sorry. So this is the individual productivity that the individual is born with and it keeps with them for the entire life and it depends on the level of education. W is the market wage that depends on gender, and there's a skill premium that depends on education. So if the individual went to college, there's an extra skill premium that also depends on gender. So we're going to have differences in gender that go through the gender wage gap for the high school, and then there's an individual potential layer of gender wage gap for the skilled workers. And it also depends on his level of human capital. So the distribution of this fixed individual productivity is going to be gender specific to account for the difference in dispersion of um, gender compensation. Uh, we're also going to allow for a difference in the baseline gender, uh, in the baseline wage, in a kind of a gender wage gap for the high school workers. And uh, again, the human capital um, follows a law of motion that depends on m work hours and initial human capital. And for this, we're going to calibrate using Imai and Kin. So because of all this, um, because of the influence of the human capital in the wage, we're going to have an endogenous evolution of the gender wage gap and the skill premium that it's going to depend on the labor force participation decisions of the individuals. So in the optimal household allocation, we're going to have these income effects that give the following. If productivity is sufficiently low for one of the partners, then participation is going to be zero. And also, if the partner's um, or you know, the spouse's wage increases too much, then there's going to be a negative income effect and it's going to cause you know, hours to drop or participation to go entirely to zero. So what we see is that the gender wage gap causes the wife's participation and market hours to be lower than the husband's on average. And this is going to further trigger a decline in, uh, in both of these um, variables if the skill premium rises. So if the difference between you know, the potential compensation of the husband, it's even bigger. So the mechanism is pretty clear. Um, what we do for the calibration is we assume these four types of households. Uh, we are doing it now for four periods, but I'm uh, working already on extending it to shorter uh, periods of time. So for now we have like four stages in life, but now we're going to have an annual model. We assume a log normal distribution for the productivity of the types. <coughs> And our strategy is going to be to set most parameters independently as long as we can and then use um, moments from the 1980 uh, variables to match uh, participation, um, to 
uh, calibrate parameters to match participation level earnings dispersion by gender and the ratio between home and market hours. <clears throat> so we assume the following functional form for utility, it's separable in consumption and um, effort. Um, and then we have the effort is divided between market hours and home hours. We allow for the disutility of effort to vary by gender. Um, and we also allow potentially for different elasticities of um, labor supply, but we're going to, in this calibration, we're going to keep this equal. So we don't have uh, too many gender differences in the parameters. And we assume a standard CS for home production. So we calibrate the parameters, these are pretty standard. We assume that the weights of each partner are 0.5, so there's an equal um, division within the, within the household. Um, we calibrate these parameters from home pr for the home production that give us you know, a nice profile of home hours over the life cycle. We use the results from Imai and Keen to calibrate the evolution of human capital. And um, for the labor market, we use this estimate, uh, latest estimate of 0.9 for the gender wage gap, taking into account. Well, so as a result, we might be exaggerating the dynamics. I'm, I'm not sure what people yeah. have on, on, your, uh, on your work. So, but. They don't have, uh, but I don't have either preference uh, differences, but I do have the different productivities. Yeah. I think it's correct. Because basically, what happens in my team, all the persistence is picked up by, uh, by the dynamics in, uh, in hours and then the dynamics in wages. Yeah. And yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And in fact, we were having um, a hard time adapting this because it was like too sensitive. And so we've, we've been struggling with this. Uh, but it was like the, the best we could get from the literature. So our next step, if, if, you know, if yeah. we don't use this, we can just calibrate it. Okay, so later I'll look at that. Uh, maybe that's going to solve all my problems. <laughs> oh, so I can use that one for this? Okay, so that's great. I want to completely show you because that have all the elements that you need because we don't have... Do, do you have male behavior here? No. Oh. But I mean, you can, I mean, she can assume a general I mean, functional form and then calibrate the endogenous gender gap in this model, no? Well, I mean, yeah, that's what I was thinking, but okay, so it will provide back some... Okay, your initial motivation. One thing I'd, I'd be worried about is trying to understand how much of the gender gap is because of the composition. Mm -hmm. of, you know, what kind of women are coming into the labor market, who, uh, you know, where the boys were negative selected in the past, and how has this changed? So, so dealing with unobservant genetics, I think, is a first order in this kind. Yeah. So doing this would help I think so because I wouldn't they, have they to to put it in the mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Well, I'll ask you later more details. <laughs> um, and then uh, for the rest of the uh, for the evolution of the exogenous component of the skill premium. And the market um, wage rate, we, we take it from the data. And then the distribution of household types, again, we take it from the data in terms of the composition of household types by partners' education. And then the only parameters that we then calibrate using the moments from the, from the, moment, from the model and comparing them to the data are the disutility of effort for husband and wife. And we do get some difference there. We then, in the exercise, are going to allow this to change over time. Uh, well, we calibrate the requirement for home production, and we calibrate uh, the dispersion of the distribution of the unobservable productivities. Can you go back one step? So where did you get 0 0.65 elasticity? Well, this so was, a, a, yeah, so, well, we didn't calibrate it. We took it from either it was Petrongolo's paper 
um, yeah, we, we took it from one of the <coughs> papers with this uh, functional form for uh, home production. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but still, so home production, the, the level of inequality observed in, you know, home hours between husband and wife is really difficult to get with the model anyways. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so this is the, these are the results from the calibrated models and this is what I was uh, mentioning. So we get the particip participation, we get the covariance, uh, the coefficient uh, of variation of the earnings distribution. But then when we look at the ratio of market to home hours, we have a hard time getting, uh, getting that moment with this version of the model. So we have to, you know, either improve um, the, the parameters in the home production or, you know, this other, we have to think of some changes to eventually get this. Because what happens here is that um, there's a, a, a lot of gender inequality in home production, home hours, that the model can't pick up. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, the first exercise that we do with this calibrated model is to increase the level of this exogenous component of the skill premium for men to match the actual average for the period 1995-2005, uh, well, for men and for women. Uh, and we compare the, you know, the moments from 1980 to the moments from 1995 as if there were steady states. So we just assume there's one economy with the previous uh, moments forever, and then there's another economy with the new level of skill premium forever. We compare those two economies. And the results that we get for this exercise is a large drop in labor supply of women with college husbands. We, this gives about 60% um, of the difference that we get from this projected versus actual exercise from the data. Um, we get a large drop in labor supply of women in college college households that represents about 40% of the difference between the projector and actual that we see in the data. And we get a rise in the skill premium for men that's larger than for women. And therefore, we get a rise in the male to female wage ratio that's higher for college than high school, which is also what we see in the data. Um, but of course, we can't, because it's a phenomenon that only affects or that mostly affects the you know, high skilled workers, we can't get a decline in participation of high school women, and especially high school women married to high school husbands, because we don't assume any change for those households. <clears throat> so here is the participation of women by education from this exercise. And we see that for high school women, um, the, the um, the calibration gives a 3% difference, but then in the data we observe this 9% difference because we also have uh, uh, the projected version doesn't get the slowdown as much of the high school, high school women. Uh, but then when we look at um, college husbands, uh, we see that the model predicts that women married to college husbands uh, participation drops 10% and that's, uh, you know, a fraction of the 17% we see in the data. And the implied uh, cost labor supply elasticities from your model are in line with uh, some Well, areas. so I would have to compute them for, yeah, the yeah. average I haven't done that exercise, but... Um, you could also use, you know, for cross-section, because in the, in the 1980s steady state, you had variation across types, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you can already maybe calibrate to match that elasticity mm -hmm. in the 1980s steady state, that <coughs> you would be more disciplined for the I see. projections. I see, yeah. 
Yeah, I guess I could try that, but then I would try to get the elasticity of the average because there's uh, everything so goes on in that elasticity, right? It's not a parameter, so... Because, you know, you could do what, what empirical people do to yeah. get the elasticity within the model mm -hmm. in a ah. cross-section. Yeah, or, yeah, and see where, where I stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, and for the skill premium, uh, the percentage change that the model gives is 25. Uh, oh, this is not, this is 15%. Uh, so it overshoots uh, the change in the skill premium, I think, because it's like, you know, husbands are very sensitive to this rise. So they, they start accumulating a lot of human capital and this go back, goes back to Costa's point, like this specification for human capital accumulation is very sensitive, so. Maybe we have, uh, there's room for improvement there. Um, and we do get um, a positive change in the gender wage gap for college uh, workers, like in the data, well, smaller than the data. So the next er exercise that we do is a more dynamic version of this uh, counterfactual, which is simulating the model every five years between 1965 and 2005 and examine the behavior of each of the cohorts that enter the model in each, uh, the, the cohorts that enter model in each of these years, um, assuming a stable decline in fee such that we get, you know, the increase in female participation before 1995. Um, so we just take this as a shortcut that captures, you know, labor supply forces that have been studied in the literature that helps explain this rise in female participation. Um, and then we also fit the trends for the gender wage gap um, for the residuals uh, and the, the male uh, wages from the data. And we compute a process for the skill premium uh, controlling for observables that is you know, stable until 1990 and then for the cohort that enters in 1995, uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, for the cohort that enters in 1995, uh, there's a new process um, estimated that has this, that shows this higher uh, level of skill premium and this acceleration that's larger for men. So this change we assume is largely unanticipated. So cohorts that are already alive in 1995, they get to re-optimize from that period onwards. Um, and what we get for this exercise is that um, there's this trend that uh, we observe for the skill premium. So this is the difference between the pre-1995 uh, and the post-1995 exogenous component of the skill premium for women and the exogenous component of the skill premium for men. So these are the trends that we assume for both of them. So the, the trend for the women, for the evolution of the skill premium for women, we almost doesn't change between the two periods, but then the trend for men accelerates for the second period. So the results that we get again is that participation drops most for women with college husbands, um, especially those women with high school education. Uh, participation rises for college women with high school husbands uh, and this again because we can't um, completely explain through these income effects the, the entire plateauing in participation of female um, or participation of women. So for different household types um, we, we have 17% uh, in the data versus 12% for the model for high school women married to college husbands and for college women married to college husbands uh, we have only captured 4% of the 17% uh, in the data. So uh, we also look at the evolution of the gender wage gap especially for the college workers and we see that you know it goes up for the college workers but not as much as it goes up in the data. So we still have some work to do for to get a better fit and this um, you know suggestions to discipline the exercise are welcome 
But what we did is uh, document this composition effect behind the flattening of the labor force of married women. Um, and we think these are mostly related to declining growth and level of participation of married women uh, to college and high income husbands. So we think these uh, income effects have a role in explaining this uh, you know, sudden break in trend. So we incorporate it in the analysis and we show that it accounts for approximately 60% of the difference between the observed behavior and the projected behavior for the post-1995 uh, period. But then it's a, an income effect only, uh, so it doesn't predict anything of what happens to the high school, high school households, for instance. So this means that there's something else that goes on into this, you know, plateauing of participation of married women that's outside of the income effect. Yeah, I looked at fertility, but for when I looked at different types of husbands, the fertility of women married to college husbands is actually remained stable over this period and it has gone down a bit. And so I couldn't, you know, that alone doesn't explain much, although it could help explain some of the behavior of the high school women married to high school husband because there there was a slight increase. I don't know if that's going to be enough. And then just a minute. And I also looked at right, right. But so what we see is um, I have that slide. Ah, oh, where is it? Okay, here. So I look at participation rate um, by husband's earnings percentile for women with no children, and for women with at least one child because that's a reasonable effect. And so you see here that this blue line is the women who are married to a husband in the top 90 percentile, well, in the 90th percentile of the earnings distribution. And these women have no children. And still we observe the same shape uh, in the behavior, which of course, when you look at those women who have children married to high earning husbands, then it's th they have a much lower participation, right? So that's also to be expected. But at least we know that it's not only the children, because these women with no children are also changing their, their participation behavior. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, our answer is that um, I think that there, there could be a role for fertility. Like we could study with the, the idea behind this home production is that eventually it may turn into a home production of children too um, and see where, where that takes us. Um, so, so that's a potential avenue. Child care time has been increasing over time. Yes. Time yes. So, so that's what I think. Like maybe if we incorporate that, you know, that, dimension we not only we don't need to produce more children for these households but only it's the, the wife wants to spend more time with the children so we could get this kind of of behavior by adding that margin okay thank you